Boss. Boss. Yeah, we on Boss Talk 101. Yeah, we gon' talk, we gon' have fun. We be on fire, we be lit lit. It's a unique hustle, big, big, big shit. Big shit, big shit, big shit. It's a unique hustle, nigga, big shit. Big shit, big shit, big shit. Name another podcast like this. Check it, check it, check it. It's a unique hustle. It's your boy ECEO, and I'm here with the lovely official Miss Jamaica. Yeah, my dad walk on. Hey, man, say, man. Hey, we in Las Vegas, man. I'm, yes, sir. Hey, man, I'm loving it, man. It's Hey, the weather was quite, it's like dry heat. It's dry heat. I oh, tell everybody, blowing. it feels like a microwave. <laughs> We're in the middle of a desert. <laughs> Take it, man. Hey, man, we got a guest today, man. He don't need really need no introduction, man. Um, you've heard his story. And uh, a lot of times, man, uh, you've seen his life story, a lot of things that he has experienced. He gave us good show, movies. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. He's been in clips of movies. I, mm-hmm. I, I, t- I went down that rabbit hole and tried to figure out, man, who is Norman Tillman, man? How's it going, man? Man, it's going, baby. Man. Right Come on to the mic a little bit. Oh, okay. yeah, I gotta man. get up closer so they yeah, can Yeah, 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 yeah. Cause okay. it's a podcast, man. We be on like Apple, Spotify, Google, all that as everything. well. You go out to everything, but we just, like I, I said. Heart. Yeah, man. We on everything. That's yeah. outstanding. Hey, man. man, we enjoy it, man. So how you doing, man? Man, I'm fabulous, I'm fabulous. You know, I went and played golf, my, my passion, my, you know. Are you good at it? Well, I'm a, you know, I'll be out there separating the homies from their bread. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. hey, man, that, yeah. hey, so is it how is the golf course up? My cousins used to come up here and, uh-huh. and play golf, man. How they, long um, you been doing it? Ooh, 30 years. 30 years. How Easy. did you get into it? You know what? Uh, that's a, a long story, but the long and short of it is I used to play ball with uh, my two youngest sons, uh, mom's uncle. And whenever, like, around 90 six mm-hmm. when tiger started getting uh famous mm-hmm. a lot of brothers started playing golf and i was like man ain't nobody gonna play no golf right but he and i used to go to ymca and play uh pick up basketball on the weekend so he was like he had stopped coming i was like what you doing man he said, man, i'm playing golf <laughs> i said really so i went out there one day and went to swinging at balls and see i'm a you know i'm one of them um competitive oh man <laughs> And I just could not let that inanimate object whoop me. It whooped me. So I had to I tried figure it. out how to control that ball. And to this day, I still ain't figured out how to control that ball. Let me tell you, I went to one of those, you know, it was like putty places you can put, go Putting golf again. Yeah. Put, yes. put golf. That's <laughs> let me tell you, I went to one of those once, only once. Man, you can and lose a lot of money out let there. Let me tell you, I could not hit the ball. I'd be one of those people like you see in the movies throw the golf club because <laughs> I'm like but, but get the, frustrated and just say oh man I'm not doing this I'm one of these people that you know because you see it on TV and in your mind you're saying okay I know I need to go with the look on the grass and see which way it's going so in my mind I'm already mathing out everything and I know exactly what I think I'm supposed to do so when I go out here and try it it don't go the way I want <laughs> you know, golf is a lot like life, though, because it's about making decisions and not getting frustrated when you make a plan to, to you know, to do what you're trying to do with the ball and it don't work out. So you got to go to that. And like I posted on uh, on social media the other day, you know, um, I don't uh, uh, um, I just wasn't I'm not built like that. Mm-hmm. You know, I've I become successful fuck up to fuck up mm-hmm. you know mistake your way to success that's how you, you know learn. but you got to keep going because you gonna make mistakes you show me somebody who's become successful and they made no mistakes and i'm gonna show you somebody who inherited all they bread hey that mm-hmm. sounds right Cause then when they make a mistake whoever it was that sponsored them you know uh they keep sponsoring them Mm-hmm. So they You're really right. don't understand what it's like to fail. You know, when you make a decision to use your last to do something and it don't work out, now you got to recoup, keep sight of your, you know, keep focus of, you know, your goal that you're trying to accomplish, but you got to back up and do something. Like I tell people all the time, if I had to, if I went flat broke, I wouldn't have no problem getting out here picking up pop bottles and cans. I say if the same meant, thing, man. It's going to get me back to step, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, to another step, to another step, and I'd be right back on course to where I'm going. I got a question. Well, I just want to say, first of all, everything is a mindset as well. Period. So if, you're, if, you, if your mind is willing to understand a certain place, 
Um, I always tell people that, you know, mm -hmm. if you give, uh, say, Donald Trump or if you give Jeff Bezos uh, uh, just a million dollars, they would consider themselves broke because they speak. They, they, they think billions. They don't think millions. So so that's a whole different ball game. It's how you think. It's all about how you think. Well, you know, I don't even look at money as money. I look at it as a resource. Uh, uh, you know, all it does is really give you the option not to buy stuff. You know, because if you ain't got no bread, you don't have the option to buy nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so my question to you. Okay, my question to you was, um, and this is, this is from a woman's perspective. If a woman wanted to, because if I if think about golf, it, to play golf, you have to have patience. Does that go for how a man treats his woman as well? A golf player, so to say, is a golf player patient with his woman you know if what? he plays golf? In 62 years of trying to figure out human beings. <laughs> I tell you, because I got buddies that are married. I'm not married, but I have friends that I play golf with who are married. Mm -hmm. Some of them talk glowingly about their wives like they're their friends. And then, you know, other guys, they talk about them like they're servants. Because, yeah. you know, you can't play golf broke. So most people that play golf got a little bit, you know, they ain't necessarily rich. But, you know, they ain't suffering from missing a meal cramps, right? Mm hmm so when I, I hear them, like, you know, they, they'll get a phone call and he'll go to scream. And I understand sometimes that, you know, she know you at the golf course, you know, but it's still if that's your wife. It's like, why do you let yourself go there when you know that she just want to be with her guy? Exactly. You know I, what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it just comes with conditioning and time and growing and, and evolving. And maturing. Maturing. Yeah. Because it, you, you, at some point, it, when you start to understand the basis of what a man really stands for in leadership, you start to take all of those responsibilities at all costs and put them on yourself. Yeah, I tell you. know what I mean? As a man. Time, um, you know, uh, they ask me, man. You was um, you had a full scholarship to the Citadel Military Academy, and you dropped out of school to distribute poison yeah. to your communities. And I say, yeah, but watch this. The drug error wasn't my fault, but it was my responsibility to make a better decision. That's true. You see a child getting ready to run out in the street, it ain't got to be your child. It's not your fault that that child hasn't been nurtured in such a way, I ain't gonna say train because you train animals, but you nurture your child to understand certain things they shouldn't do and they won't step out there and do that. Mm -hmm. But you got the little child that you know you pamper them and you, you know what I'm saying? You don't mm -hmm. really discipline your child like you should. They run out there in the street, get ran over by a car. But if you stand in there, you're an innocent bystander. As an adult, as a grown person, you're supposed to stop that child from getting hit by that car. For sure. Now, after you grab that child back from the curb, maybe you might want to sock their parents up a little bit. Mm, mm. So that's get on it. your job. That's get it. Get on your parent job, just like our communities right now. Our communities ain't safe for our women and our babies. And as men, that's our job, to make our community safe for our women and our babies. We can have piss contests to the world blow up. We ain't never supposed to let our communities get to a place where our women and our children don't feel safe taking the baby to the park. They could potentially get shot on the way to the park to let the baby play in the playground. It's crazy. So you say that, okay, so back then you made a poor decision um, with the choices that you made. You're older now and wiser. How are you trying to change that narrative right now and to help these young kids and some, some, sometimes it's even older men, women who are still trying to be in the streets, trying to do, you know, Crazy stuff. How you know, are you I, trying I, to change that? My primary focus right now are my three sons. I got a 36-year-old, a 28-year-old, and a 24-year-old. And they introduced me because I've never been, you know, back in the day when we was involved in the drug trade, you couldn't allow yourself to be consumed by anything. You couldn't be, you couldn't exercise the disease of addiction in any kind of way. You couldn't allow yourself to get so stuck on something that you lost focus because this could get you dead. Mm -hmm. um, so I really, you know, after I stopped selling, uh, you know, that poison, 
I became a drug treatment counselor. I started sending people to drug treatment to wow. become clean off narcotics. Wow. I worked with Jim Brown, talked to the gangbangers about, you know, is there a retirement tank, uh, plan to gangbanging? Is there a 401k plan? I mean, what, what really are you trying to get out of this gangbanging thing, right? What's your success story? Like, with all the people you've helped? Because I'm sure there's some that you couldn't help. Yeah, and that's the other thing that I had to let go of. And Jim told me, you know, dude, you're not going to save everybody. But at the end of the day, keep doing what you're doing. And if you only save one, you've done a fantastic job. So, you know, right now I'm involved in the cannabis and hemp space because I personally think that cannabis and hemp are perfect complements to the human anatomy in terms of the endocannabinoid system. And I, you know what I'm saying? I could get real technical. And yeah, yeah, that. yeah. But yeah. The but point they, is they that still call that drug. They, they're still saying that drug. Because <laughs> look at um, Carrie, Shakari Richards, and that got booted for, you know, And that was a tragedy. Weed. Because marijuana is not in any way a physically enhancing substance. It didn't make her be able to run faster. All it did was calm her. You know, they created a, a, a hemp strain called Charlotte's Web that the, the Stanley brothers out of Colorado gave to a little girl named Charlotte Figure because she was having epileptic seizures. seizures. I heard it's good for that. And they give them kids Ritalin and all that other synthetic stuff. You know, when you take Tylenol and ibuprofen, yeah, it get rid of headaches, but then it mess up your liver. Anything organic that you put in your body, you know, I used to know Dr. Sapi, the world-renowned mm -hmm. herbologist, and, be, and, you know, he went over there and they say he starved to death. How did that happen? So, wow. I mean, all over there's controversy, you dig? But what at the end like of the day, him? it was amazing. And watch this, true story. My brother, my oldest brother, who died in 2007, he had liver cancer. He was told five years prior to him dying, that if he kept drinking, he was an alcoholic. If he kept drinking, he was going to die. He started drinking that odorless alcohol, Everclear, unbeknownst mm -hmm. to us. And then one day, because he used to go play golf with me, he was sick. And he didn't want to go. And the next day, he started gradually not eating. And we was like, man, what, you all right, dude? And he, full disclosure, <clears throat> I'm still drinking. He was like, oh, man, I called Dr. Savy. Dr. Savy said, man, come on, get these pills. It was herbs and, you know, that stuff that he deal with, right? Mm -hmm. He said, get that to your brother. He'll be fine. And he said it real nonchalant, like, I've been doing this, bro. I've been dealing with, you know, all disease in your body has to do with mucus. That's what yeah, he said. that's what he says. Yeah. So he said, man, get that to your brother. Should go away. And it did. You know, no. You know what my brother told me? I don't want that shit. Wow. He didn't want to wow. deal with it. You see what I'm saying? So, man, I, you but know. But something as simple as some pills just to see if it works. Like, why but not? But it was pills, it was powders, it was all kinds oh, of combinations of. He don't want to have to deal earth, with, have right. to make it and do this and He do just want to take Tylenol. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you go to Walgreens, get some Tylenol, no problem. Yeah, but it's got side effects. Of course it does. Is your brother still living? No, no, my brother passed, he passed away. Oh, yeah. Okay, but the the, the thing I, I I looked at was the Nipsey Hustle with the Chronicles. What what was it? Um, that the that movie? one movie. Yeah, uh, you you was uh, playing the uh, you Love Chronicles. Two love Secrets Chronicles. Revealed. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that and Love he produced Chronicles. Produced it. Part produced too. Executive yeah. produced. Yeah. Co-executive yeah. produced. Yeah. Right. So so how was it like acting as his father on that on that scene? You know what? Ironically enough, that was that was really just a last minute thing. Yeah, how did yeah, how did it happen? You know, that was a black female that wrote, directed, and produced that film. Mm -hmm. So that was when our homeboy's wife, Tyler Maddox, and while she was filming and we were on the set watching her film, she was like, We need somebody to play Nipsey's daddy. Wow. And I mean it never occurred to me, you know, he was like really, you know, you, you, have fair similar, skin. you have similar features, though. Well, that's what she said. Yeah, <laughs> and they all start saying, come on, Uncle Shitty, man. Come on, man. You can play it. I'm like, you can yeah. play his daddy. Because, <laughs> you know, I've never, you know, anybody that knows me that know that, you know, Freeway Rick Ross was my best friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I ain't never wanted to be famous, ever. That's why didn't nobody know me. 
Yeah, yeah. Period. Until so the this was your first time out. acting. Yeah. <clears throat> and I had been to film school. You know, I'm a stud that wants to be the man behind the man. See. Yeah, I get see, it. I know Slim. You know, behind Baby. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Lil Wayne. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know Slim, the guys yeah. Behind the guy. Man, I love those guys, man. Just love yeah. the way that they. I love the way Slim. He just stays back, and he, he, you, you don't never even hear or see him. Right. But you know, that's another thing that we love to do because we also interview a lot of video, videographers, producers, and so forth. Because if it wasn't for them, this artist wouldn't be the person that they are. So we try to give shine to the people behind the scenes, and so many have came on our platform and say. <coughs> This is my first interview. I don't do this. I don't like to be. But we want to say homage. We want people to know this is the person who's doing this. Even if you never do another interview again, we need to know, let people know this is the person you hear when you don't and see I anybody. Get it. And, you know, I did it out of respect for, you know, him because, mm-hmm. you know, that's my man, 100 yeah. grand. He told me, you know, and he said, I say, him, you know how I feel about that. He said, I know him, but. You know, do this one for me, right? I said, okay. Something about them guys that say, do this one for me, right? Because <laughs> yeah. I know that, you know, if he asked me to do it and he know, you know, my, you my disposition, right? right? It must be something to it. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay, well, I got to support it. Wow, you man, we, are, we definitely appreciate it, yes, man. Um, and and like I said, when I, when, when I called him, I was like, man, I'm going to Vegas. We're just in Atlanta and I want to, you know, I want to interview some, some interesting people who can come on the platform and help others. You know, that what you've said tonight, um, it'll help others. Some people, that's, start, the whole point. that's the whole game. That's the I whole mean, and, and to point. stop things and staple it in time right now with the way that we have all this technology is very, it's a very important thing. And, and so to do it from a perspective to where we control the narrative as well. Period. So that's the Period. whole game for us, man. We got to take something and make it our own. Even the short films, the movies, all the stuff. We got capability now. I just interviewed C. James, who has the new movie. Uh, what is it? Um, nice Guys Finish Last. Mm-hmm. Um, he's out of Arkansas. He ain't out of Hollywood. He ain't out of, you know what I mean? He ain't out of uh, uh, New York. He and did he that did whole movie. Did the casting and everything. And it's a brilliant piece of work. Mm-hmm. And, and you know what I mean? We can do things now. Um, you look at, you know, even Tyler Perry down when he was down there, you know, it's like people got capabilities now that they never had before. And a lot of time our mindset, as we were talking earlier, your mind still stuck on yesterday, but things have changed now. And we have to be, a, be a, uh, what? We have to be a product of the change that we, we want, we, we, we are in. We got to help people. We got to show people that they can make it, you know? So, and the younger generation is going to be more powerful if we just, just do a little bit of things right, right? Well, you know, one of the one of the uh, things that I learned during the time in the '80s was that we had a lot of money. Yeah, you know what I mean. I remember when Magic <clears throat> first came to L.A. to play for the Lakers. Right, he was the first million dollar basketball player to get a contract for a million dollars. We were in a club called the Paradise, and one of the little kids that you know was one of our little customers. He wasn't even old enough to be in the club. He was already a multimillionaire. Wow. He was flirting with, we was up in the the VVIP room. And Magic had left. He was there with a little female. And the kids started rapping to the female. And he told, she told him, I'm with Magic Johnson. He was, man, who is Magic Johnson? Wow. (laughs) He played basketball. Oh, for real? Oh, okay. But he, you know, he persistent, just at it, right? Magic come back and uh, he said, oh, oh, that's my girl, man. And you know, he was arrogant. He was like, that ain't what she told me. Yeah, and he talking to Magic and he up there six nine. He told Magic, he said, yeah, oh man, I know you. You that tall brother that uh, the Lakers just uh, gave a million dollar contract to, huh? And Magic started smiling with pride, like, yeah, that's me. He said, I might have that in my pocket. You want to sell your contract? <laughs> and he's a child. Wow. wow. And back then, I thought that was just, you know, we, we was dapping. He's like, ooh, you heard what he said? <laughs> but Bars. In, in retrospect, the ignorant shit, man, that was just ignorant. Yeah. What we should have been trying to do is embrace magic in them. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. And become involved in investing in some of the things that magic and them not got going on now. You know, we were, for the most part, Magic was 19. I was like 24. 
Wow. So I was really his big homie. Right. You know yeah, what yeah, I'm yeah, 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 yeah. And if I had really thought about it back then, but we was, you know, we was living a it's dangerous It's a competitive life. world back then. It's it, it, People weren't trying to invest in anybody. People weren't trying to see other people When nobody come up. trusted mm -hmm. anybody. And there weren't enough people that look like us. Yeah, I was about to could, say that. That, that we could confer, you know, yeah. defer to, yeah. to ask them questions about what is an annuity? Correct. What is a timeshare? What is a, you know, in all these different types of investment vehicles? What is a keyhole? I didn't know nothing about none of that stuff until I got out the game. Like you said, you went back to and got your degree in engineering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went back and got my degree in business administration. Wow. And after dropping out of college to sell that poison, I had a full scholarship to the Citadel Military Academy. Wow. Got in trouble, got suspended from the team. Call my mom, say, Mom, I, you know, I'm hungry, send me some money. She told me to call Rick. And when I left going to the Marine Corps three years earlier, Rick was illiterate. All the homies was illiterate. Wow. They couldn't read or write. You seen that in the documentary. Mm -hmm. They taught us mm -hmm. how to read in the penitentiary. So I said, what could possibly they have done that, you know what I'm saying, would be of a benefit to me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me not knowing, he a multimillionaire selling that poison. Wow. In fact, he the biggest poison seller on the planet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not time. knowing. So it took me six months. I was a millionaire. Wow. And it's right around in the t between the time that I should have gone back to school. I was like, go back to school for what? What they going to teach me in school? I got a million dollars now. Yeah. That's but when they, we were chasing money. Exactly. We didn't understand wealth formation. You know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. We didn't understand that. We've on the on this show. I've met so many people who are very very talented, and some of them are on the street, and they are not willing to give that up because that feeds their family. That you know gives them the lifestyle that they want. How could you advise a young kid who is in that position? Because you know they always say, "Well, I'm going to either die or be in prison." Cause that's the lifestyle that comes with that. How can you really tell them, no, here's another option? Because all the other options that I hear people telling them, they're like, well, that can't give my family money right now. Well, what you know, you we live them? in a microwave society where you know everybody wants uh, immediate gratification, mm -hmm. and it's difficult to tell a young person. Especially when, like I said, you know, they've suffered from missing a meal cramps. And with the media giving them this constant barrage of images of quote unquote being rich, then they see their peers. They see the Cardi B's and the uh, Offsets and the Beyonce's and the Jay Z's and the, all the, you know, these celebrities mm -hmm. with the jewelry and the, you know, the whole opulent lifestyle. And that's what they aspire to want. Right. But they don't they don't really get to see the behind the scenes. They don't see the blisters and corns that Beyonce got on her feet from the hours and hours and hours that she had to be in that gym, you know, that local gym practicing that presentation that she's going to present to you and charge you two hundred and fifty dollars to come and see it. They don't see that. Wow. You know? Definitely. <clears throat> so I don't know. I just tell them, you know, um, your health is your wealth, you know. You need to um, really understand that this, this life journey is not a dress rehearsal. This is it. And if you're willing to allow yourself to be exposed potentially to something that you could quite honestly lose your life doing, then you have in your decision making process is immature. You know, we used to teach in the Mary I Can program when I used to work with Jim Brown about life skills. You know, I didn't even know the phrase goal setting process, decision making process, conflict resolution. What is that like? Huh? Like you talking about stopping a fight. But, you know, you get exposed to new ways to say something, but using different words. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So when you think conflict resolution, yeah, okay, so basically you're saying that there's a technique that I can employ when I see two people 
in a heated debate or argument or about to have a fist fight, you know, I can escalate or de-escalate that situation based on a process that I can use to get inside their head and say, what is this really about? What is this really about? What y'all really mad about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just like wealth creation. I know that y'all didn't start out with all this equipment. You got some very technical stuff in here. You didn't know how to use this stuff before you knew how to use it. Mm -hmm. But what you did have is the perseverance and the patience. Because I know you bumped your toe. Nobody's successful that no. I've ever met. No. No, it's didn't a lot of late some nights. And a lot of late nights. Didn't have some hurdles to jump. That's over, right. Some speed bumps. You know, you had to walk into a couple of walls to yeah. realize. You know, definitely. But you never lost sight of your goal. No. You never lost sight of the fact that if you just keep pushing, just but, keep putting one foot in front of the other. I think it's just like hustling back it in the is. days. It's the same thing as, as in the streets. When I was in the streets, you know what I'm saying? I had, I'm an extremist. Whatever I do, I take it to the max. So when I was in the streets and I was hustling, uh, uh, getting to the money, um, I remember occasions where, you know, things would happen. Um, they, we would get massive amounts of loads of stuff that came to the community. Well, when I got my pack and, and my partner got his pack, well, I'm breaking everything down. I'm running circles around anything and every, anybody can, you can't deal with me and it's the same way with any other thing I'm doing um, I always say in sports when you meet a guy that does sports I said this earlier today he don't just run track he can play basketball he can play football he can even play baseball he will whoop you in kickball he can do it all usually that talent just over exceeds each you know category of sport that he touches and th- that's just when you're dealing with somebody who who, who has favor, right? Mm-hmm. And so we didn't know that when we was in the streets that we didn't know we was entrepreneurs or, you know, we were thinking about- You never about, even knew that word. D- didn't know it, didn't care to know it. You thought, was a hustler. Never thought and about it. that's who you were. That's it. And there was a pride in that. Exactly. There was a pride in the fact that you didn't allow yourself to accept the idea that the lifestyle you wanted to live required that you got up and went and did something for eight hours a day and had to take orders or instruction or whatever you want to call it from somebody else. And you didn't have to do that. Yeah. Now that might have been a a ends to a means, but you were still focused on trying to get to where, like, you know, now Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. being an entrepreneur, being a self-sufficient human being, Mm -hmm. being able to control your own time. Definitely. I wanted to ask you something. I wanted to um, ask about coming from Chicago to L.A. What was that move like, like when you first started? Initially, it was because um, I was acting. You know, I got kicked out of the Chicago public school system for being ignorant. Okay. Literally. I, uh, I was really smart, always have been. But we, I found... You know, I had a nickname. They called me Little Roy Fontleroy. Okay. And I'm sure that you you know that being intelligent in the hood sometimes can be frowned upon. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's crazy. Mm-hmm. Now, we endorse, and I find, you know, when people talk to me, the first thing they want to know is, man, what was it like having $100 million when you was 25? <laughs> they don't think about how many people had to put that shit on that pipe and smoke it for me yeah. to have that. Yeah. Right? Nobody, oh, they know you, nobody. Was, man, you was driving around in a Corniche Rose Road. You was just that. Don't the they be talking thing. about them stories? They love, it's like, so I be crazy. like, ain't nobody else I did don't nothing. Don't talk about that. Nobody cares to hear about it, but they keep that. bringing it bringing it back up because it's exciting to them. I mean, right. you, you talk to people and they be like, Hey man, why don't you just why don't you just come back, man? You've heard that over the years because they've never done it and on that level, like that life. And it's like, really, I that's come, what it is. I could never go back. It's like uh, it's like a, a, a some person going back to his own uh, moment. It, it's it's just when God delivered wow, me. I never thought about it God, like that. But nah, that's when exactly, God delivered me, man. Yeah, it is. is like I, I I made a vow to God. I could never go back. Right. The, the, you know, in ninety five. I made a vow yeah. and and I've been true to it. I don't drink, smoke, nothing. I ain't trying to toot my horn, but when I made a vow, I changed my life. 
And I think that's that's credible, you know. Um, uh, absolutely credible. And, and absolutely. I, I think and I, a lot I of applaud you. Doesn't that, make man. you no better than nobody else. And don't doesn't, make you and no you worse. still got trials that you gonna face. You go through things, but at the end of the day, those are things that I held dear to me. I knew my vices, and my vices was this is gonna trigger this, and I'm gonna do that. Yeah, but those experiences that you had. A bump in your head yeah. have given you information that you now use when you make decisions about doing certain mm. kind of stuff. You still make mistakes, of course. but you don't make that big of those mistakes. Got it. Your mistakes get more little and little and minuscule and minuscule and minuscule until it get to a point where you kind of mistake free a little bit. Almost, yeah, 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 you know? yeah. So, yeah, that's what I'm trying to get to, man. I just know that, uh, you know, I'm doing a thing called a remorse and redemption tour. Okay. So I go around and I tell brothers, yeah, man, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that uh, I didn't have fun. I did. Yeah, right. Well, a lot of fun. But you're going to look back on your life and you're not going to be real proud of yourself. When I became a drug treatment counselor, you know who my best customer, the people who were referring the most people to send the treatment? The same studs I've been selling that shit to. There it is. And they were bringing me their aunts. They sisters, they mamas, they all kind of, hey, big homie, man, oh, put my auntie, man, I'm tired of watching her do what she do. And you know, they using that shit. It ain't nothing they won't do. I had to get out the game because a stud came in and it was my job to make them tell me what they rock bottom was. What happened that made you decide, man, I got to stop doing this. Dude told me he was letting drug dealers have relations with his 12 year old daughter. Wow. Hey, I, I was done. My objectivity went straight out the window. Mm, mm, mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, Mr. Norman. Yeah. Uh, I, I, me, me, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I want to touch on, you were mentioning earlier off camera about um, what you're doing with a cannabis to be able to help um, young entrepreneurs, build young entrepreneurs. Can you go ahead and tell me a little bit about that? You know, um, I'm a numbers person. So, you know, I deal with the ones and the zeros, the matrix, right? So when I look at stuff, even back when I was dealing with the poison, you know, I knew what my cost of goods sold was. Therefore, I could know what my profit margin needed to be for me to accomplish the goal, which I was trying to accomplish. So when you look at cannabis from seed to sale, you look at the cultivation, right? Right now, and I spoke to a lady in Massachusetts, she told me that a wholesale pound of marijuana is worth $5,300. My research shows that it don't take $250 to grow a pound of weed. What's the in-between profit in that? How many jobs? The weed got to be cut off the tree. It's got to be clipped. It's got to be packaged. It's got to be marketed. Those are opportunities for people to live a sustainable, mm -hmm. economically mm -hmm. sustainable life. The same way I said in the documentary when I seen how much bread these youngsters was getting it, I want some of that. I want some of that now. Hey, I want like some it. of that. Yeah, it ain't about me. It ain't about, you know, I'm, I'm old enough now. Well, I've been old enough, but you know, <laughs> I realized that selfishness, you know, the way for me to discreate in myself being a victim by way of a young, hungry somebody out in the street see me, oh man, potential, I can stick him up and go get me, you know, some money and go eat me a sandwich. A dude that got some bread ain't got time to crime. Already. So if I do everything I can to create in people economic stability, I discreate my ability to be a victim mm -hmm. to somebody hungry, you know? So I like it. That's man. why I'm involved in it, man. So check it. And man. you ain't got to be a rocket scientist, you know? So no. you give back to these women. You were saying something about. Um, well, I, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get entrepreneurs, existing entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. to allow themselves to embrace the concept of each one teach one. Mm. You become a mentor and you literally adopt a person and you walk them through the process of becoming a business owner. Mm. And you don't sugarcoat it or blow smoke, you know what I'm saying? But do you give them a grant for to help them um, Well, not so much a grant, but just uh, it's like a, 
a or getting stipend. started gift. The mm-hmm. stipend, exactly. But that stipend is designed to then put them in a position because, and especially black women don't realize, you know how much money is out here in grants, money mm-hmm. you don't have to give back for a young, for black women who are trying to become business people. How can a black woman qualify to get um, what you're giving out? You just you just got to be do you oh you talking about for my personal for your program. personal program well again I have a uh, it's this social media page called Clubhouse and I have a page on there called Freeway to Business and what I do is I hold meetings every week for the members people that have joined and I ask them to tell me why do they want to become entrepreneurs because you know you. And when everything shut down, you don't go home. Mm-hmm. You got to clean up and put up gear That's and right. the whole nine. If you That's own right. a restaurant, after you shut it down, you got to clean dishes and mop floors. And you see what I'm saying? So people don't understand that being a boss means you eat last. Mm. I know what I wanted to ask you. I, 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 and I'm, I'm skipping, but I wanted to ask you about how you and Freeway, got, when y'all did come together, how did y'all, how did y'all, I know the operation was already in motion when you came to it, but being that you scaled up like you did, was there ever a time where you seen some cross, you know, others and basically did others try to say, you know, input things to say, man, you, you, you this or you that. All the time. You see what I'm and saying? That still goes Cause that, that's the way, that's the way I would think it would be going that's when going that type of money is being made. speak with this uh, insurrection thing that happened on January the 6th. And these people are sitting up saying that what we saw with our eyes didn't happen. Mm. We didn't see people stabbing police and, you mm. know, mm. it was just like regular tourists. Wow. So back in the day, you can imagine you know, they did that movie with uh, 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 about Alpo where he killed his supposedly best friend over the fact that he bumped into the connect. Mm. But y'all was both winning. Correct. So jealousy and envy and all those ugly kinds of things, that's what reared their ugly heads. I heard a lady call me today and told me that the person who I'm now working with to form my company backstabbed her to meet me. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wow. I was like, wow, people just throwing each other under the bus. Why you don't embrace the fact that now that we working together, you jump in and we all jump in Mm -hmm. and work together to reach a common goal, Mm. Mm. which is to provide people with opportunities to identify resources so that they can become a blessing to somebody else and keep the blessing going. Hey man, you know what I'm saying? Let me, let, let me. I just want to say, man, thank you for coming on the show, man. man thank man, you for coming question. and blessing the platform, man. Uh, shout out to Uncle Henny. Um, shout out to yeah, uh, no. Freeway. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, man. Really spoke know. very highly of you. Everybody that I ran into, uh, what what is his name? El- I keep calling him Echoes because of LJ that came up. Echo, Echo, uh-huh. Echo. Shout Rich out to Nines. Echo, man. Yeah. He, he th- mm-hmm. As soon as I said your name, he bam, yeah, man, that's my guy. You know, it's just it's, it's just a wonderful thing to see brothers that look like each other able to get along on the level that you guys are doing it, and it's successful. Well, you know, that's the reason why our the Freeway Boys was so successful is because we've always had a philosophy that if, if there were 10 of us and one of us had $10, that meant each, and nobody else had no bread, that meant each one of us had a dollar piece. Hey, man, that's the way it got to be. That's the way at. we got out. Well, thank you so much, man, for coming on the show, man. We love you, brother. Number Absolutely. 10. I love you all right. Hey, back. man. It's, it's been another great segment of Boss Talk 101. And we out.